Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast on the topic of optimizing animal study designs. Today's presentation is titled Critical Appraisal of Animal Studies. My name is Julianne Chai, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. For more information, please visit LabRoots.com. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive, and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You could submit questions by typing them into the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button on the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window or submit a problem through the green Q&A button on the lower left. I would now like to introduce today's speaker. Dr. Siobhan Barron. Dr. Barron has worked in the field of laboratory animal medicine for 15 years. His accomplishments include inventing a freezing protocol for non-human primate embryonic stem cells that increased the stem cell survival rate from 5% to over 90%. He additionally contributed to the development of one of the first canine embryonic stem cell lines. He has since pioneered new territory by developing and improving an effective online surgical training in the laboratory animal medicine field. Dr. Brown currently works as the head of Innovative Animal Technologies and Training at Novartis Institute for Biomedical Research. He serves as an adjunct assistant professor at the Wake Forest School of Medicine, the editor-in-chief of Surgical Savvy Newsletter, and director at large for the Academy of Surgical Research. He is additionally on the board of directors for Americans for Medical Progress and an editorial board member for the Journal of Veterinary Science and Technology. Dr. Baran earned his doctorate in veterinary medicine from the University of Pennsylvania in 2002. He is currently working on the refinement and development of gastrointestinal and laparoscopic rodent reproductive procedures, as well as the development and implementation of surgical competency assessment programs. I will now turn it over to Dr. Baran for his presentation. Well, thank you so much for this um, worthy introduction. And I would like to also thank all of the participants um, joining us this late. Um, I know for some of you guys, it's still early afternoon. For some of you guys, it's at night. Um, but we really appreciate, um, or at least I really appreciate you guys being here. So like during the introduction, we're going to talk about really how to bring a surgical model in-house and we're really going to concentrate mainly on rodents however you can apply all of this into larger animals as well one of the things i wanted to mention that for example this morning reading in a fortune magazine um, there was an article um, addressing um, revving up corporate speed and they're talking about in there about all of the different resources, technologies that's available to us. And when they're being implemented, the speed at which the decisions are being made at these various companies has been slowing down. So for example, hiring, hiring um, you know, 2010, um, it was, took about 42 uh, days and now it takes about 65 days. Um, so I think it kind of applies to this process because, um, or some of the other processes that we implement in lab animal medicine, that when you apply new processes, um, it can be frustrating. Um, it certainly can increase the amount of time that we spend on it. However, over time, um, we end up, just like in this article, um, they end up with better candidates uh, that come on board. So it decreases the rate of nutrition, the rate of uh, people quitting, um, and all the other challenges that potentially come with uh, when there's not a good fit between employer and employee. So it's the same thing um, in the process that we're going to talk about today. I think initially it might be even a little bit overwhelming. Um, and when we implemented it, it took a little bit, actually quite a bit longer, but over time, uh, we became used to it, um, and now it's very efficient. But what's more important, it really provides us with the right um, surgical models. So with uh, any further ado, I'm going to go to that next slide. And first, what you really have to make a decision is, do you need the surgical model? 
Um, is it really important, um, or is it something just nice to have? So in this scenario, we're going to assume that you really need this model. This is part of a PhD project that can move forward without it, or it's the next uh, blockbuster um, that depends on it. So there's really two ways that models are being uh, brought in. So one is the conventional way, which includes, for example, a postdoctoral student um, who needs to implement the model uh, in order for the project to move forward. So she or he end up reading various references, uh, publications. Um, they might look at some of the videos that are available on the internet. Or in another way, for example, uh, you have a surgeon that's at the facility, and um, even though they have not performed a specific procedure that you need, uh, they have enormous amount of experience in other surgical procedures. So they end up doing similar thing, looking at references that are available. Uh, they might look at some of the video content that's out there. Um, so most of the cases uh, in bringing new models fit in between those two. And I think there's a few challenges with that. One, uh, some of the videos that are available on the internet, very often they're uh, pretty short. Uh, there are time limits for them. So they might be good for basic procedures like implementing a subcutaneous pump or um, you know, something basic that takes you know, a few minutes or so uh, during surgery. But if you're talking about more complex procedures like GI procedures or uh, neurologic procedures, telemetry procedures, very often those videos are quite edited. Uh, so you can't really get a good idea of uh, how the whole procedure uh, moves forward. The other aspect for references is looking at the publications. Very rarely have a full procedure described um, in the publication. Um, and also instrumentation equipment uh, very often doesn't address complications that occurred and how the procedure was developed. Um, so when we looked at that process, we decided that there are some points where we can refine it. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you guys today about is um, in the end, what we ended up with uh, and how the process uh, works. So here are just the various steps, um, and uh, we're going to go through each one of them. Uh, but you need to look at the collection of references. You need to review the references, summarize references. Then we're going to talk about protocol development, facility considerations. Of course, you also need to consider equipment and supplies that are available to you. Uh, we're briefly going to touch up on the test subject, you know, the animal that's part of the procedure. And you definitely need to look at, obviously, the surgeon. Then we're going to discuss financial considerations, and we're going to give you some of the examples on uh, what uh, the different costs that come along. Uh, that might be a good start for you guys if you want to implement this uh, process. Uh, talking about timeline considerations. Um, and then also, you, you know, how do we decide if it's going to be in-house or are we going to outsource this, pro this, this project? The other steps is also really piloting the surgical procedure, which is very important. And very often, um, at least initially, we ended up missing that step. And I think most people very often do as well. So then we're going to talk about, you know, how do you assess the procedure uh, that's being performed in-house? And the last two steps include protocol refinement and then piloting that surgical procedure. So collecting references. We have a lot of different resources. Uh, so here's just a few examples um, that we end up utilizing. Um, and we go through really each and one of them. Um, and very often in each one of these databases, we end up locating one or two articles, if not more, they are appropriate for us. And when we look for references, we really look for anything that mentions uh, the procedure that we're um, interested in. The other aspect is the three R's, which obviously we have to pay attention to for a lot of different reasons. Um, and so here are some of the list, um, the, or I guess databases or websites that we utilize uh, for that process. And this PDF, of this presentation is available to you, 
Um, so you can have that as a reference uh, if you like to use um, or check out some of these websites. So these days, social media is huge. We're all in one way or another uh, and work with it. One, obviously you're here at LabRoots, uh, which you have a network uh, for, or I think as some of the people refer to Facebook, uh, for uh, scientists. Um, it, this is one of the resources that we certainly utilize and we ask questions um, and we receive feedback. But then also um, some of the other uh, groups that are um, in here. So for on LinkedIn, um, there are uh, various groups like Laboratory Animal Science Group, Academy of Surgical Research, uh, American Association for Laboratory Animal Sciences, and also in a PDF that you'll see we have links uh, for these uh, for these groups. But the way we utilize these is we ask questions, um, they're post questions, and you can get feedback from the experts in those areas. Um, because again, very often, folks who are part of these specific groups um, have similar interests um, in surgery. So we're gonna talk about the collection of references, but before I move Forward. I also would like to um, poll the audience. Uh, so if you could answer this question, do you perform surgeries in rodents? And this will give me a little bit of a better idea of who is in the audience um, and give my presentation a little bit more towards the audience. So about 60, almost 64% um, perform rodent surgery and 20, um, and about 30, I guess it would be 35 that do not. So now there's one more question, if you wouldn't mind answering. And do you perform surgeries in species other than rodents? So here we have a little bit more even split. Um, 50, almost 48% say yes, you do. Okay, fantastic. That gives me a little better idea of who the audience is. So here are the links that I mentioned that you would see on the PDF that's um, available for this presentation. So collecting references, what we also found that emailing the authors um, of the references that we, or manuscripts or papers that we have read. Um, and during the process, over several years, we found that really the second author of the paper usually is the person who performed the procedure. And it's also very open to talk with us and, and provide us with some information uh, that potentially might not be um, in the manuscripts. We also found that it takes about three emails to do that, and very often when we end up talking to the authors, they mention you know they didn't see the email or they uh, skipped it um, or whatever the reason is. But in most cases, they're pretty open about discussing uh, and providing additional information. The other part, um, what we also do is end up following up with or setting up a phone call or teleconference with that person. And you really find out a lot more information um, that you can get, one, especially from the reference, uh, but even from the email uh, interaction, uh, because you can ask various post-up questions. Uh, so those are very helpful. And we, over the years, average are about 85% uh, of different procedures that we have implemented. And one of the things I can't stress enough, you really need to take detailed notes, um, for me at least, 
Uh, if I don't write it down, I forget. Um, so uh, even if I think, hey, I'm going to remember this very often, I do not. And I think that's the case for a lot of folks. So really make sure you take detailed notes uh, when you have these conversations. So now when you have collected the references, you need to review them. Um, so what we look at is, does, do the references mention a septic technique um, and some of the basics of the procedure? We also try to find out who the surgeon is. Is this someone who has a lot of experience, no experience? And also what country um, the reference, the publication is from. Because very often, for example, not often, but in a few cases, uh, some of the drugs that are available, for example, in Europe are not available in the United States uh, or vice versa. So then we also look at the survivability. Um, so mortality and morbidity, uh, that's something that's really important. And what we found that through the conversations and the email communications, we find that what's sometimes in the publications, um, to get to those numbers, very often, you know, it took somebody several months to develop that model, um, which is really important for us, especially when we're starting out the model in-house. And then what's the length of the study? So, for example, if you perform a procedure and their study was only two weeks and have 100% survivability, if your study is supposed to be six months, you have to take that into consideration because you might see different numbers that they do. So the next step is summarizing these references. And here I cannot stress enough, you really need to put as much detail into that process, into this step of the process as you can, because this will make the following steps significantly easier uh, for you um, when you implement this. So now we're gonna talk about protocol development. So obviously you need to look at the surgical procedure um, from all the different descriptions of the conversations that you had. You need to look at the animal information um, and consider, are you gonna be working with the same species? Um, hopefully you are, since you collect these references. But very often it's also useful that, for example, if you're looking at, um, let's say, gastric bypass in a dog or a non-human primate, uh, reviewing that literature even if you're thinking about doing a procedure in rodents. Um, so you need to look at the basic aspects of your animal information, of your patients, the species, strain, age, gender, housing. Also, consider the enrichment and the nutrition. And we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, in a few slides. You also have to look at what type of facilities uh, would be required for the protocol. You also have to look at the equipment and the supplies that were utilized. And, and again, especially some miscellaneous supplies, um, that's where you get most of the information when you have the teleconferences um, with the folks who have performed these procedures in the past. And what's really important is to develop a checklist. This will make your life significantly easier when you have to have someone asks you for you know, what you need, you can go through that. But really when that's important is when you actually get to the point where you're gonna be doing that procedure to make sure that the process is running efficiently, do you have, that the procedure is running efficiently, so you have all of that items that are necessary uh, for the specific surgery. So now let's talk about the review process. So for us, when the protocol was developed, and that was usually developed by one or two surgeons, then it's being reviewed by additional surgeons uh, who most, it would be nice if they have experience in the same species. It's also really good to get feedback from experienced surgical technicians because they give you a slightly different view. And scientists, I think it's really important to involve the scientists for whom the project or the surgery um, and the animal is gonna be for. Because for them, again, this is like a tool that they're gonna utilize. So you wanna make sure that what you're deciding to do, it really also 
make sense for them as well. So it's really important to get their feedback during this process. So now let's talk about facilities. Um, so as you're thinking about performing those procedures, even if you do have surgical facilities, um, for even rodent facilities, for example. Uh, so you perform basic surgical procedure in your facility, maybe this is a more complex procedure. So there are requirements that are going to be slightly different or sometimes quite a bit different. So you need to look at the macro environment, uh, which is the surgical suite. Um, and in large animals, even if it's obviously the various areas, and see if it's available for you to perform those procedures. And then looking at the micro environment. So this is mainly for rodent surgery. Um, so you're looking at the surgical area. Is it large enough um, for all of the equipment that you're gonna need? So for example, if you're performing telemetry, you know, bring your te uh, software and uh, computers into the room so you can check if the telemetry is working during the surgical procedure um, or near the end and immediately afterwards. Um, and as we know, very often rodent surgery suites are pretty tight, um, um, at least in my experience. Um, so it's really important to address that before you jump into these projects. So when you consider the supplies and the equipment, you need to develop a wish list. So everything that someone has recommended added to their list look at the protocol and your experience and your colleagues' experiences. But in the end, really, you also have to look at the reality. Uh, so for example, surgical, microsurgical instrumentation can be pretty expensive, you know, eight to, you know, 12, 13, 14, $1,400 a piece. So if you need 10 new instruments, that's a pretty significant investment. Uh, so are you able to um, invest in those packages, or are there other things that you could potentially utilize? So again, it's one of those aspects where you have to consider, um, do I need these, uh, this equipment or this instrumentation, or is it kind of a nice to have? So we already talked about the test subject, but when you're considering and selecting it, these are all of the aspects that you have to consider. Um, you know, the species, is, there, is it the right species or potentially are you moving forward with the species because it has been in, um, described in references. Uh, so for example, a lot of procedures have been performed in, in rats uh, because they're larger, um, so it's slightly easier to perform those procedures. Uh, but maybe a better model or a transgenic model that you need is only available in, in mice. And again, this is the process in which having the scientists participate is really important. Um, and then looking at the background, the strain, the gender, age, weight, size, and also looking at the references, the procedures that have been already performed, that you talk to folks who have performed them, are you gonna be performing in the same species, in the same um, sex of the animal, all those things have to be considered because they might have a pretty significant impact on the outcome of the surgical procedures. So one of the examples in the outbred animals for gastric bypass, the survivability is uh, hundred, almost 100%, but if you go into transgenic models, some of the diabetic models, um, that can decrease by a couple percent. So just setting up your expectations uh, will, knowing this information, and will make that process a little bit easier. The other part, a little bit mentioned that, but are you going with the appropriate model or are you going with the easiest model? Um, and sometimes what we have found it as a surgeon, there's some species or specific uh, breeds that I would like to, or transgenic uh, mice or rats that I would like to work with, but maybe they're not the best model for the scientist uh, or for this project. Uh, so again, you need to consider that um, as well. Surgical consideration and selection, this process is very important, uh, especially when it comes to rodents, uh, because very often folks who perform rodent surgery uh, do not have surgical or uh, medical background or veterinary background. Um, however, they're very 
quite a few very excellent surgeons uh, that do that. But again, if you have, a, for example, a postdoc that's jumping into performing surgery and they have never performed surgery, you have to consider, you know, how is it he or she is going to be trained? What's the time frame from the training? Do we have personnel available and the resources to provide that type of training? And then when you have working with an experienced surgeons, you need to look at the comp competency and proficiency. So also looking at internal Personnel, so we kind of talked about uh, on the previous slide, so let me go back to that. You know, you have the inexperienced surgeon or experienced surgeon. But if you decide to go with an external surgeon that potentially is going to come to your facility, well, we find that develop, well, we have developed a questionnaire uh, that we utilize for that. Um, and in that questionnaire, we ask the background, um, the specialty of that surgeon, um, how did they learn the procedure, uh, from whom did they learn the procedure, how many times they have performed a procedure, and also when was the last time that they performed this procedure. So if they have done this two or three years ago, potentially the, one, the first couple of animals uh, might be or should be utilized uh, for uh, the pilot uh, before you jump into the actual animals that you're going to use on your project. Then also asking about the success rate, so mortality, morbidity, but then also the longevity of that uh, project, um, like I mentioned before. So is your project going to be six months and their experience with the model is, you know, two or three weeks. And also asking for references. Um, I know that's not always feasible, especially in the industry, that you can't just call up your, you know, provide the references. But if they are available, um, we highly recommend reaching out to them um, and confirming or finding out a little bit more information about the surgeon. One of the things that we find in providing a uh, questionnaire allows the surgeon on their own time to fill it out, think about it, uh, and provide us uh, with that answer versus having a TC uh, or an in-person conversation um, where it might be uh, a little bit intimidating. So now we're going to talk about the fun stuff, the financial considerations. So here I'm going to go through with you on the table that we have. Um, on the left-hand side, you're going to have, see the process, then the personnel that we involve in the process. And obviously for your facility, organization might be uh, slightly uh, different. Then also the time that's required to complete the specific process. Then we have the hourly wage. And for that, we end up utilizing which you can see on the bottom there on the left-hand side, the 2014 uh, Laboratory Animal Facility Compensation Survey. So obviously that might be uh, slightly different depending uh, where you live. And again, this is for United States. And then on the right-hand side, the last column is going to be the subtotal for that specific process. All right, so let's go to that next slide. So the first Step was collection of references. Um, research technicians um, assist us with that. Um, on average, it takes 13.7 uh, hours. The hourly wage, $23.6. So it adds up to about, not about, but adds up to $323. So before I go to the next step in the process, something to consider is also the references that you will need. Um, so here we have, if you're looking at individual articles, you know, the cost varies between $25 to $45 per article, average $32.5. So um, on average for us, we have used about 47 articles. So if you end up paying for that, that's a little bit over $1,500. Um, if you're looking at individual journals and subscriptions, and this is again on the bottom here, you can see uh, from Elsevier website, so that might differ also depending where you are, uh, but the cost is between 144 to a little bit uh, under uh, $4,500. So the average cost, we took 86, $862 per journal. Um, so using 14 journals, again, on average, that's what works out for us. Uh, that's a little bit over $12,000. And I'm well aware of that, obviously, universities, 
um, and various pharmaceutical companies, large companies have access to these databases. But very often, what's uh, for us, what we found, especially looking at the older articles, um, and this is something that very often what we found people miss is that some of the procedures that we're interested in have been done in 1950s, 1960s, 1970s. But very often, those references are not considered that far. And when you need those articles, very often they're not in these databases that uh, large institutions subscribe to, so you have to end up paying for them. So again, it's just an additional cost to think about uh, when you are thinking about bringing in a surgical model in-house. All right, so now going back to the chart, uh, so we have the next step is review uh, and summary of references. So for this, we end up utilizing surgeons. Um, and here, you know, you have the time, a little bit under 90 hours um, at $62 per hour. Again, this can vary quite a bit um, depending on, you know, if you're in academia, industry, where you are in the world. But the subtotal for that is uh, $5,400. So the next step, uh, surgical protocol uh, development. Again, for this, we utilize surgeons. Um, and the number of hours, it's 14.9. So that ends up being a little bit under $1,000. Then facilities review. So this is where we work with the technicians and the surgeons, we'll do a walkthrough um, and review what's available for the facilities. Um, so that takes pretty small amount of time, but again, everything adds up. Uh, so this is, um, you would have a little bit over $100 to a little bit under $300, so $400 together. Then looking at the supplies and equipment, um, again, this is where the surgeon and research technician is involved, um, and altogether that's about $600 for their time. Then we're looking at the animal selection, uh, so this is where the scientist and the surgeon is involved, um, and they have a discussion, you know, like we talked about what would be appropriate model. So that's a little bit under $300. So then performing a surgeon selection, it's a little bit under $200. And for that, you have the surgeon and the surgeons are involved. Then we're looking at the surgical procedure piloting. Uh, so this is where the surgeon, uh, veterinary technician or the research technician uh, is involved and um, that cost is a little bit under $1,000. So one of the things that's not considered in this chart, in this table, is organizing and scheduling of the rooms, of the animals, uh, the procedures, uh, surgical suite occupancy, you know, what's the charge for that? That varies quite a bit by the institutions. Post surgical duties, so you know, surgical suite cleaning, instrument cleaning, and sterilization. Looking at the disposable supplies, uh, new supplies they need to get, animal cost, um, animal housing, post operative care, and nutrition, uh, which is very important um, for, and will, it should differ um, for surgical, for animals undergoing surgery versus uh, typical diets uh, that you have and uh, providing to the animals uh, when they're not undergoing surgery. So we're not providing the costs for this because this is going to vary quite a bit between facilities and organizations. But if you are interested, um, you can contact me after the presentation and uh, I'll be happy to chat with you about those costs. So, you know, we talk about surgical procedure piloting. Um, so the next one is uh, piloting or assessing that pilot procedures. So here we involve surgeons um, and that's a little bit over a thousand dollars. Then you have the surgical protocol refinement. So now looking at the procedure that was performed, we sit down and look at what are some of the refinements that we could incorporate into the protocol. And you will see that very often uh, there's quite a few even after all this whole process that we looked at. So then running a surgical pilot study, you know, you're gonna have the surgeons, veterinary technicians involved, um, research technicians, um, 
and that's um, about five thousand dollars. So altogether, um, for for this, you're going to end up with about sixteen thousand um, dollars, and this is over the time period of time and number of procedures that we have developed. And obviously, that could vary a little bit, but I think that gives you a little, like a good idea, or you know, what what's the cost that you would um, have. Uh, thinking about bringing a new procedure in-house. So the timeline consideration, I think this is also very important. Bringing a new procedure in-house is going to take time. Uh, it's not going to happen um, overnight. So what's the timeline that the scientist has or the PhD student has? Um, you know, is that, for example, you need to test something, a compound or a drug that's already on the market in clinics, uh, and you need to do additional studies, um, or it's in the final phase of the preclinical trials. So all those things are going to play a huge role, and it's really important to consider that, that a new model is not going to come on board within a week or two weeks. It certainly takes time um, to have an, a model that works appropriately. So... At that point, you make up your decision. Is it going to be in-house or are we going to outsource it? So again, for the purposes of this presentation, uh, let's decide that we're going to do it in-house. So the next steps include uh, piloting of the surgical procedure. So this is where you can do one, two, or three animals. Um, when the surgeon is, you already obviously have selected the surgeon, um, and the procedure is video uh, recorded um, because that allows very surgeons afterwards to review that video and one assess to a certain extent the capabilities um, of the surgeon. But more importantly, are there any refinements that we could implement throughout the procedure? Maybe looking at a different surgical instrumentation that's easier to grasp something. Those are some of the things to consider. So after that, after you pilot the surgery, then we're looking at protocol refinement. Um, so again, that allowed us to assess the competency of the surgeon, not the proficiency because it's such a small number of animals that we use for, for, for piloting. Um, the test subject um, also consider post-operative care um, what's necessary? Did we have everything that, that, that's required? Um, do we have um, all the staff that's available? You know, does the post-op care have to be uh, 24 hours or is it um, enough, uh, you know, a shorter period of time when everybody is there at the facility? Looking at the environment where the animal is being recovered. Um, and again, after piloting the surgery, it gives you a pretty good idea of do you have all the equipment and supplies, including the miscellaneous supplies. So what's really important that you need to define the success rate. Um, so again, through all of the references, this whole process that you have done, you need to decide what is the success rate. So is it 95% of the animals surviving for 20 weeks, two weeks, 40 weeks? Um, and then again, the number of animals that's required. Um, so that's also very important. So are you going to be doing... Um, if you have a 20% um, mortality rate, you might need more animals um, for that procedure. So it's really important to identify the number of animals required. So here, I want to provide you with a validation or a short study that we looked at um, where we implemented our refined process for bringing surgical procedures in-house to um, the conventional way um, that many people uh, bring in animal surgeries in-house, and we have certainly done it in the past as well. So here we're looking at um, a couple. One, you have the gastric bypass in a rat. Um, that was done through conventional uh, process. Then we had gastric bypass in a mouse, and that was performed with a refined process. Then we have kidney transplant in a rat, um, and that was performed with the defined, I mean, I'm sorry, the refined process. And then we did, uh, brought in kidney transplant in a mouse, and we used a conventional 
process to bring that model in-house. So here in this table, um, you can see on the left-hand side of the procedure, on the second column, we provide if it is a conventional or refined technique or the process that we incorporated for it, the species. And then what's the important columns are the mortality column. So you can see that for conventional way, when we implement it that way, um, our mortality was 25%. Uh, when we did that in a mouse with the refine process, it dropped to 5%. Um, then for the renal transplant in a rat, when we brought that in um, with the refined processes, um, the mortality was 10%. However, when we performed a dissimilar procedure in a mouse and brought that in-house uh, with the common, uh, the conventional way, that, that the mortality rate was 30%. The other aspect where we looked at is number of complications that happened. So that's the next column. So for the conventional rat gastric bypass, uh, the number was 21. Um, but then when we utilized the refined processes uh, for the mouse for the same procedure, the number of complications uh, was five. Um, and when we looked at the renal transplant with the refined procedure with rats, again, the number of complications was five. When we brought in the renal transplant technique in a mouse, utilizing conventional technique, um, the number of complications was 22. And then the next column, we looked at the number of refinements that we implemented. So uh, using a conventional technique um, in a rat, we end up implementing for the gastric bypass, 17 refinements. The next one, when you look at the gastric bypass in the mouse, utilizing the refined technique, it's only three. And so the big difference there is that a lot of the refinements that we end up implementing in the conventional technique after the surgeries have already happened, we already have implemented those um, during the process of developing the surgical protocol in a refined process. And you can see on the bottom, again, the last two for the refined for a renal transplant in a rat, the number of refinements was only three, where for that with the conventional technique for the mouse, it was 14. So now just some statistics uh, for you to look at. So this is the mortality. Uh, so on the left-hand side, you have conventional, and on the right-hand side, um, you have the refined uh, technique. Uh, so with their refined technique, we found that uh, it's significantly different, a uh, lower mortality uh, percentage. Then we look at complications. Um, again, with the refined process, uh, we had significantly less complications than with the conventional process. For refinements, uh, we had significantly less refinements with their refined technique uh, than with the conventional uh, technique. And again, the reason for that is that most of the refinements were implemented during the protocol development before the surgeries um, because of all the information that was available to us. So I think what's very important that initially also um, as these processes, as we develop these processes, we ended up um, asking for 20 animals to be um, alive to have successful surgeries uh, because we found that with the conventional processes, uh, various complications happen afterwards and et cetera. Now, utilizing the refined process, we look at that five animals for most of the procedures um, have to be, have to survive uh, in order out of five uh, for us to uh, move, move forward. So this slide just summarizes uh, the steps that we already described um, that are incorporated in the refined process that we have implemented. And same thing with, uh, with this slide again. So it's just the steps that um, are required for this process to work. 
So at this point, I will take um, any questions or comments, suggestions, um, and also by any chance if you'd like to reach out to me after this presentation or any time really, um, here's my uh, email address. So if we could uh, describe how to do the Q&A session again, I would greatly appreciate that. So Julianne, if you would be able to do that, that would be great. Thank you for that informative presentation. So before we get started on question and answer session, I would like to remind our audience how to submit questions. You can submit questions by typing them into the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button on the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. Our first question is from Paul Stein of SoCal Preclinical Services. He says, your charges are frightening to the unknowing, but they are based on company chargebacks between internal call centers. Such systems are archaic and stifle new product development when cautious managers want to make an impression with their bosses through their cost savings. It is much better for companies to see animal facilities as open shared research services where everyone is on paid salary through corporate and all costs for any particular cost is zero, R&D is too important for cautious middle managers to be afraid of spending money. So what are your thoughts? Too important for cautious middle managers to be afraid. So thank you so much for um, that comment. And I we totally agree with you on that. Um, the reason why I just brought up the cost um, is just that's some of the things to consider, uh, but I agree with you. And unfor unfortunately or unfortunately, the systems are still in place um, and are um, very often considered. Um, so until they go away or we decide, we all decide that R&D is more important and really not to, um, as you say, stifle uh, the moving forward, um, you know, it's still something that we have to think about and consider. So the next. Hi, Madalena Fenio of the Institute of Cellular Biology and Pathology asked to please give some refinement examples. So, but anyhow, thank you so much for that question. So, the refinements vary significantly. So, some um, little things like, for example, going from a six out suture uh, to an eight out suture or nine out suture, uh, different suturing materials, to providing uh, different um, animal monitoring equipment, um, especially when it comes to rodents, uh, depending for, for example, doing telemetry. Um, so. Again, it, it can vary quite a bit, but those are the, the, the most common uh, ones that, that, that we utilize. Um, again, at this point, our facility is pretty well set up for that, uh, but throughout all of these processes, um, again, instrumentation um, has been also a big one. Uh, so a lot of times um, what we have found that utilizing uh, different uh, instruments from that utilize in neonate surgeries um, or even have surgical instruments uh, specifically developed for uh, specific procedures uh, utilizing 3D printing uh, these days. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities for that if you have that, if that's available to you. Um, but those are is just some of the examples. So um, I hope that answers your question. And if it does not, uh, please shoot me an email and I'll be more than happy to provide you a slew of uh, examples um, that we have incorporated over the last, uh, almost over a decade now. Olapa James from Canon Ministries asks, how quickly can technicians be trained for refined surgical models? So 
So, so that's an excellent question, and it's a it's a tough one. Um, as an example, what um, if the, so? I guess I just want to make sure I also do understand the question correctly. So, if you if the person has performed uh, or has been performing that procedure, and now you're looking to refine that procedure, that can happen um, if they're open minded. Pretty, pretty quickly, pretty rapidly. Um, I mean, again, just um, incorporating some of the things like assessment, the videography of the procedure. Um, but if you're talking about learning a, a, a new procedure for a technician, um, that can vary significantly, obviously, with the procedure. One of the examples uh, recently that was published, they're just learning the correct suturing technique for veterinary students. Um, it takes them for like the surgeon's knot and a square knot. Um, I believe it's about two and a half hours um, just for that. And we well know that when we uh, do training workshops in, uh, in our field, um, you know, we spend maybe a day or a couple of days uh, training in these different procedures. We're here just for the basic knots. It took them two and a half hours to be competent and proficient in that technique. So I hope that addresses the question, your question. If it does not, please uh, add another short comment in there, and I'll try to address it. If there are no more questions, I would like to once again thank Dr. Shafan Baran for his presentation. Do you have any final comments? But well, I see that we have a uh, pretty full uh, virtual room. So uh, again, I provided my contact information, and I will be certainly very interested in hearing your feedback. Um, you know, how do you develop? Uh, again, I said that the conventional technique is very common, um, but maybe I'm wrong about that. Maybe that has changed within the last several years. Uh, so if you, you develop uh, different models and you have a process for it, I would love for you to uh, get in touch with me and uh, discuss it. Um, again, we're looking for any uh, input that we, would allow us to improve our techniques. And then also, of course, if you have any questions that I can help you out in any way um, during these processes, I'll be more than happy to chat with you. Um, again, just reach out to me by email, and we can do it by email or, or a TC. But I would also like to thank LabRoots uh, for the opportunity to present this content um, and also for running uh, this event for the fifth time uh, and already have scheduled next event for uh, 2017, uh, which is also going to be very exciting. Um, so, um, again, look for that information that's coming through. You can actually, I believe, even register for it now. So you receive all the remi reminders for it. Um, and, again, thank you to you for coming to this session. Have a great rest of the day. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through six months from the live date. You will receive an email from LabRoots alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay. We invite you to forward the announcement to your colleagues who, have may, who may have missed today's live event. See you next time and goodbye.